Please welcome to the stage Senior Java Developer Advocate at Oracle, Ana Maria Michalchano, and Senior Java Developer Advocate at Oracle, Nikolai Prolog. The future of Java is you. But how come? Isn't Java just a technology, something that a few smart people put together that can stand on its own? Yes, Java is that. But it's also much, much more. It's developers creating solutions for the users. It's night owls working on pet projects and specialists tackling the hard problems. It's experts sharing knowledge and educators teaching the next generation of Java developers. It's people making connections in this community. It's you. The future of Java is you. I'm Anna, and together with my colleague Nikolai, we, we welcome you to the Java Community Keynote. In the next hour, we will meet a few people from all over the world with diverse backgrounds and interests, but they all share the love for Java, the fact that they are part of this community, and that they have made significant contributions to it. Moreover, uh, we're going to learn what they contributed from, with what they contributed with, but we hope to inspire you to contribute even more. Well. Those being said, we hope that next time, at the next Java One, you'll be here on stage sharing your story of your contributions. But before we get to those lofty goals, let's ground ourselves in the present. Where is Java at right now, and what are good ways to contribute? No better person to talk about that than our dear colleague and Mr. Java community himself, Sharad Chander. Well, welcome back to Java One here on our last day. I can't believe these last three days have gone by so fast. And while today may be the end of Java One, the Java journey continues forward. Now, there are three important storylines to Java One, and we reflected on two of them earlier this week. One, was technology leadership from Oracle to ensure Java meets your needs. The second is enterprise value. But for me, the most important part of that storyline is community. It's the stewardship of the Java ecosystem that's so important to the heartbeat and the future strength of Java in the future. Now, it's important to remember the foundational programs that have made Java and the Java community so important for the last 27 years. And we explored some of these programs earlier this week. Now, one program in particular really stands out for me, and that's the Java Champions program. You'll remember this slide from Monday. These are the current 50 members that were brought into the program over the last two years. And it's a symbol of just how strong and vibrant the talent is in the Java community. You might also remember I asked everyone to pull out a camera, well, your cell phone, take a picture of this and post it online with the Java One hashtag. And I was going to give someone a very special, priceless Java coin. It's not Bitcoin, it's worth much more. And I believe that person is here. Aaron Schnabel, are you here? Aaron, you need to come up and, and take your treasure. Congratulations. So, how do we move Java forward? Halloween's just around the corner, and I thought instead of giving you a trick, we'll give you five interesting treats programs and ways to stay connected, to learn, to connect, and to collaborate. I do like that Duke. Whoever created it, that's brilliant. So the first one is early access builds of Java. This is extremely important because this is your opportunity to give us feedback before the next release. And guess what? Java 19 just came out. We already have early access builds of Java 20 available, which will be available in March. So please, download it and give us your feedback. Second is, well, where does the magic happen? I get that question quite a bit. And the reality is, there is no secret trick. 
There's no magic. Java's done all out in the open. All of that development happens at the OpenJDK project. We encourage you to sign up to the mailing lists, read of all of the innovation that's happening in the conversations, and if you want to participate, we have multiple levels for you to be able to contribute your knowledge and your talent to shape the future of Java. Now three, I really enjoy. As I get older, I feel myself being more immersed in the digital world, especially on online. So we ask for you to connect with us on Twitter and follow the Java uh, Twitter account. We have over 500,000 followers. You can keep up with the conversations as far as what we're doing, what we're saying, and living up to the promise is ensuring that Java moves forward. Now, four, four is very interesting. Our team has been upping its digital game, and this is important. As great as it is to meet in person, and I absolutely value this, we extend that conversation in the digital world. All of you have different methods and modalities as far as how you want to be reached, and we've been focusing on many programs to deliver content and knowledge to you, especially on YouTube, so please follow YouTube, dot com forward slash Java and immerse yourself in all of the learning digital programs that we have there. But what's really exciting is also the team behind Java and the Java Developer Relations team. They've all developed unique programs that not just represent Java, but themselves. A piece of them lives within each of these episodes and all of the content they produce. The human element is extremely important, and we want to ensure that content represents that human element. Now, five, five is very special to me. Inside.java, as you learned earlier this week, is a place where you can get information from the Java team in terms of what we publish. Dev.java is something all of you need to bookmark on your browser. This is our learning portal, regardless of your level of skills. Whether you're just starting, you're intermediate, or you're advanced, we have tutorials and learning information and content contained within dev.java. But also important is all of the community programs that continue the heartbeat of Java. You can learn about them there, participate there, and join us there. And guess what? We're also expanding the format. We want to include you. So now we're looking at ways to have your content be part of this journey and this experience to live with inside dev.java. Okay, remember, these programs are represented by people. While we all love Java so much, it's the people that give life to it. And so I encourage you to follow all of our developer advocates, listen to them, but more importantly, they are gonna be listening to you. Our most important role isn't the content we produce, but understand what your needs are. So we always have an open ear to what you're saying and what you're doing. Now, before we conclude, someone yesterday made a really good point with me. Shar, we're all in this room, we're at this conference, and we're connecting together. But what about other individuals who are not here, who are also helping shape the future of Java? And I took that to heart. And so it's my commitment to feature one individual in the community every week to highlight new people to expand our circles around. And so today, on this stage, I've picked someone who's very special to the Java community. Chandra Gunter, if you don't know who he is, is one of the most outstanding Java developers I've ever had the uh, pleasure to meet. He works at BNY Mellon, He's been instrumental to integrating Java into their banking systems. He's also reestablished the Garden State Jug out on the East Coast. And more importantly, he's been critical to helping formulate new Java user groups around the world. And there are so many more people just like Chandra, and it's important that we highlight those individuals to you. So look forward for more updates on individuals that you should connect with moving forward. So let's get this show on the road and learn about all of the various things that Oracle and Java are doing together to make the community so vibrant. Thank you.
Thank you, Shar, for highlighting how people move Java forward in this community. I would like to invite a few members of the Java community on stage to tell us more about how they grew their involvement in their respective communities. Everyone, please welcome Elder Moraes, Java champion and board member of So Java. Mala Gupta, Java champion, co-leader and of Delhi uh, in CR Jug. And of course, Mohamed Abulait, Docker and Java enthusiast and co-organizer of Arab Jag. Welcome. So, hope that you're all comfortable. We'll start alphabetically with you, Elder. Elder, could you please share about how you got involved in organizing community activities? Sure, my first experience with community engagement and organizing events was uh, back in 2017, when on SoJava, the, the group that I'm part of, we organized a series of uh, interviews with top uh, Java enterprise developers, luminaires of the world, like Adam Bean, David Labassi, Reza Haman, Ed Burns, and so on. And what I learned from that, that experience is that uh, groups, user groups, Java user groups, should be open to the newcomers, like I was by that time, because this will cause a huge impact on their lives, on their careers, because I can for sure say that if it wasn't for that experience, for that opportunity, I wouldn't have the career that I have today, and probably I wouldn't even be here on this stage today. So, and by the way, uh, so Java, thank you. It's great to hear, thank you. Mala, how about you? In 2013, when my first book on Java certification was released, my publisher at Manning Publication, Mike, asked me if I could connect with my local jug and talk about my book there. So that was the first time I connected with Delhi Jug. And they organized my first talk. And the reason I stayed was because every member, the leaders, they were so welcoming. And now I organize the sessions at Delhi Jug so that I can probably support uh, all the other members, new and old, with the same warmth and um, encouragement. And a lot of people ask me, why do I volunteer with the Daily Jug, and what is it that keeps me going? So to all of them, and if you have a similar question, I would like to say, when you become a part of a community like a Java user group, you have limitless opportunities and uh, areas to grow. And for I have been able to find so many friends in the Java community. So it's not limited to just my local jug, it's the jugs across the globe, and that's amazing. And to everyone asking the same question, I have an acronym too, which is FUNDRIL, F is for family and friends, U N, just leave them. Uh, D is for drop your fears, R is for rediscovering yourself, I is for getting inspired, and inspiring others. L is for learning a lot every day. And the last L is for the leadership. You become a leader when you become part of a community like the Java user group. Thank you, Mala, that's very inspiring. Mohammed, well, enthusiast of, jo of Docker and Java, my favorite things too. Uh, can you tell a few things about what were your first steps that you considered when organizing JAG activities? Yeah, sure. Uh, throughout the past couple of days, I have the chance to, and the honor to, cha to share a couple of ideas and exchange with community leaders and Java champions as well. And we can sum it up to three factors, I think. The first one is inclusiveness, making sure that the community is welcoming for everyone and creating a safe space to share ideas, exchange knowledge, and share knowledge, and especially for underrepresented communities. The second thing is actually localization, creating local content, improving our empowering local speakers to present at your communities and meetups, and like, like uh, even small things, like creating a logo that represents like community and values. And the last thing is consistency. And as the saying, saying goes, consistency is key. Like creating, for example, uh, your meetup at a specific time, probably the second week, or second Wednesday of each month, that will create kind of a rendezvous for your community to celebrate uh, your community and exchange ideas and know that the second week, second Wednesday of each month, it's actually, um, part of knowing people and meeting people. That's great to hear, thank you. Well, thank you everybody for sharing your experiences and I hope that this is inspiring you as well to be part of a Java user group or of another community and share your experience and lessons learned as well. 
Well, in this case, thank you again for being here with me today. And I would like to invite the next guest about and talk a bit more about um, growing a community or more. So everybody, please welcome my dear friend, Brian Vermeer, Java champion, leader of NL Jug and Virtual Jug. Brian? Hey, good morning, or as I would say in Dutch, Goedemorgen. Yeah, that, we got Dutch people in the room, and I love that. All right, let me tell you something about the NL Jug, the Netherlands Java user community. Um, we are not your average user community. Um, we have about 4,500 members nationwide, and our nation is small. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, we started in 2003, and we try to make Java better in our country. The things we do are not meetups. You might say, what do you do? Well, first of all, we have a magazine, Java Magazine. And I know that if some folks are in the room here, thank you for your, for your cooperation on this. Um, it's a magazine, printed magazine, that we spend to our uh, members. Um, that can, they can write articles so from the community for the community. And it is great, because we have new members and new people writing about the stuff they love. Next to that, we have two major events. One is JSpring, which obviously isn't spring, has nothing to do with the framework, though. And the other one is JFall, which is, you guessed it, in fall. JSpring focuses on senior level content, 800 attendees, and it's quite small. And then our flagship event, JFall, is November 3rd, uh, 1,500 attendees, and it's part of the membership that you, that you have with the NL Jug. So it was sold out in about mm, 24 hours which I'm very proud of. Seven tracks, a lot of uh, new speakers, a lot of good speakers. But adjacent to that, we see that we have a speakers mentoring program. We try to get new speakers on stage, helping them creating abstracts and new talks, and getting them, getting them up there. So 10 to 20% of our speakers are brand new, and I'm very proud of that. Next, you see on the screen that we have a bunch of local jugs in Amsterdam, Utrecht, Rotterdam, Appeldoorn, and many, many, many more. The Anal Jug tries to help them out, to endorse them, and to make sure that they, they can deliver their meetups to their local city and local community in the best way possible. But did you know that I'm not only a Java developer and love to drink coffee, I was also a bartender. Okay, that's amazing. Well, in this case, why not put those bartender skills to work? And for everybody in the room, we have a surprise for you. Well, today, Brian, our Java champion, will prepare Java Ritas. So, to get yours, please queue up to, at the side of the stage and enjoy. In the next part, um, I would like to well, make a short reminder of the fact that Java user groups encourage conversations around Java, around best practices, about lessons learned. Um, but many of us have started our Java journey having teachers delivering Java lessons, having instructors sharing more about in beginner or advanced development topics. This being said, I would like to welcome on stage somebody that can t talk to you more about the impact of Java in education. Everyone, please welcome Senior Director, Java Product Management and Development Engagement, Heather Stevens. Heather, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Stage yours. Hello. <laughs> Get myself situated here. Uh, wow. There are a lot of people still here. That's a little scary. <laughs> OK, so I sometimes masquerade as an extrovert, and I am absolutely not one. And getting up here was not something I actually wanted to do. But this topic is super important to me, and I know it's super important to you. Um, so I hope you'll give me a little bit of grace if I stumble at all. And uh, also, I brought some toys along. I had a reason for that. And we will get into that later, but for now, Hopefully, I don't lose the clicker when I do this. <laughs> Have some fun. <laughs> um, there will be more of them coming out from the sides. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> uh, <laughs> OK, so <laughs> now that you're properly distracted, <laughs> Um, I thought when I was thinking about what to talk to you about when I came up here, I could reinforce 
The tremendous upside of Java, that was a good one. <laughs> or <laughs> I could share the challenges that teachers and students have as, as they work on making sure that computer science education is a mainstream thing. Um, I could talk about some of the challenges that we know that we have with onboarding for Java in that first experience. But I wanted to start instead with a story. Um, so recently, I got the opportunity to go to CS EdCon in Florida, which was put on by Code.org. And I met a woman there, and she told me a story, and, and her perspective really reinforced for me why it's important that we, we get students and their teachers and their parents to be inspired by what they can create, to feel unstoppable as far as solving the problems that they care about solving, and feeling connected to a group of people that care about solving those problems. So Luella Mack Webster is her name, and, and Luella is a PhD. She's a former teacher. She now works for the Mississippi Department of Education as a CS program supervisor. And Luella is a black woman, so she understands what it means to live in a community that might have less access to these things than you or I or our kids have. Um, she also comes from an educated family. Her father is a lawyer, her grandfather was a lawyer, her husband is a lawyer. So she understands the great value of education and evolving a society and making things better. Luella believes that programming skills are critical for every student to have in this modern age. And she wants every kid in Mississippi to have that kind of access. So Luella was telling me about two 17-year-old uh, twin boys who got the opportunity to study computer science in high school. They lived with their 94-year-old grandfather. And Grandpa owns a 350-acre farm. That's about 350 American football fields. Um, and it is a fourth-generation farm. So you can imagine, he's 94 years old, <laughs> doesn't know a lot about computer science, um, doesn't think it's important, that's newfangled programming thing, why does he care, right? What he cares about is his legacy, his family's legacy in this farm. And he expects these boys to stay home and take that farm over. Well, the boys went and applied for college because they wanted to study computer science. Uh, and because they were 17, they needed grandpa's sign-off to do that and Grandpa wouldn't sign that letter. So Luella decided she was going to do something about that. And so she uh, left the city, got in her car, drove down to the Mississippi Delta to the farm to visit with Grandpa. She spent the day there, and she listened more than she talked. She learned about what he worried about, what he struggled with, what he cares about, what he hopes about, what he dreams about, what he wants for his future, for his grandkids' future. Um, she even climbed up on the tractor, she told me, and uh, got dirty. <laughs> he was all worried about her getting dirty, so she climbs up on the tractor, gets dirty, drives her all around the land. And at the end of that, um, Grandpa decided he liked Luella, and he invited her in for tea. <laughs> and so Luella then could have a conversation with him. She was a friend, right? She could have a conversation with him about why programming was important for him and for his farm, why he should have his grandson study programming. She could talk about things that he has no idea about, like John Deere tractors with IoT devices on the edges to, to plant the seeds at the optimal distance so you get a high crop, crop yield, or drones that can assess the health of the crops and let the farmer know that they need to add more water or pesticide. She could draw a, a line from his problems to the value of uh, programming and computer science education for his grandkids and the future of that farm. And if you listen, or at least as I've listened, um, over the summer at these conferences, you hear forms of this story everywhere. Um, and as this digital revolution continues, the thing that we started, that is now infiltrating everything everywhere, in rural communities, in urban communities, everywhere, right? We need to help students and teachers and their parents see the possibilities give them reasons to want to study computer science, to solve the problems that they face every day, draw a line between where they live and the problems they want to solve and the power of the things that we have given them to build from. 
Um, I especially loved that Luella, just one person, could get out there and make a huge difference in a kid's life and, and change that. We all could do the same thing by creating a bridge um, between what we know and what, in many cases, these other people don't yet see. And of course, we all know that Java itself is moving. It's vibrant. It's inspiring. It's unstoppable and connected. You are inspiring and unstoppable and connected. And all of these statistics that you've seen this week, we want to double and triple and quadruple those, right? I want the two millionth certified Java developer. And to do that, we have to capture the hearts and minds of the future builders and innovators. And it, we don't have all the answers, of course. It's a really complicated problem that um, spans into public policy and uh, funding for schools and all sorts of things, right? Um, but we do know a few things that we can do uniquely to help. So we know, for example, that it's important to remove friction in that very first experience for a brand new developer. Um, things like Brian Getz is, is pitching forward with his paving the on-ramp um, proposal in the Project Amber. We also know that we need to help people see themselves in our community. I mean, I know we're all gray-haired, but how, would, how do we bring the next generation into this? How do we help them inspire each other and create the next wave of community for Java? So in the next few minutes, I'd like to uh, speed round, bring up some folks to talk about these two points a little bit. Um, I know it'll just whet your appetite, but we're going to do a little with the time we have. Um, first off, JavaFX continues to be a strategically important framework, and it's a key component to making modern solutions that are tangible. And as you all know, that's important for kids. So it's a place where we are investing to remove friction. And so I'd like to hand the mic to Kevin Rushforth, Java FX project lead to talk a tiny bit about that. Where's Kevin? Which direction? There he is. <laughs> Welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Heather. I'm excited to be here today to talk about Java FX. Java FX, for those who may not know, is a modern UI toolkit that enables application developers to create desktop apps with rich content. We first released JavaFX back in 2011. It was included in earlier versions of Oracle JDK as part of the modularization effort several years ago. JavaFX was made available as a library that can be downloaded separately and run using a JDK of your choice. JavaFX is developed as an open JDK project with contributions from Oracle, Gluon, and others. Development is guided by the JavaFX project co-leads, which are Johan Voss from Gluon and myself from Oracle. Gluon continues to provide builds and downloads of JavaFX, as well as other tools like Scene Builder. Today, we are pleased to announce that Oracle will also be producing JavaFX builds. Starting now, you can download early access builds of JavaFX 20 from jdk.java.net. You will now be able to easily get early access builds of JDK 20 and Java FX 20 from the same place using, <laughs> and using JLink, you can easily build a custom JDK that includes those Java FX modules. We also plan to release GA builds of Java FX 20 when JDK 20 GA goes live. So, looking ahead, we will be exploring what new features we should add to JavaFX and thinking about better ways to make JavaFX even more approachable for students and developers who might be new to Java. Enabling educators and students to learn how to implement compelling UI content using the modern capabilities of JavaFX will help ensure that Java remains relevant in education. We're already working on some new ideas and innovations in this area, which I'll be demonstrating in my session titled JavaFX 19 and Beyond later this afternoon at 2.30 p.m. in room 228. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. That's really great to hear. 
Um, as I said, I think it's important that kids have the ability to create something that's tangible to them that they can see. And so JavaFX is a really important part of that. Now, on the second point, the community, uh, you all are a force to be reckoned with. And I have heard uh, oodles of passion from you about this subject this week. And I'm so glad to hear it. I wanted to invite some folks out on the stage briefly to talk about some of their views. And again, it's just going to whet the appetite. <laughs> so welcome. And while they're coming out here, I want to set your expectations. So it's a speed round, speed Q&A. And, &A. and uh, I know it's, it's not going to be enough, so we'll look at doing deeper interviews uh, later. And I'm the timekeeper. No jokes about more cowbell. None. It's a recess bell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so these folks need no introduction, but we're going to start there. Um, so each of you have 10 seconds to please state your name and share what you love about Java, starting with Jose. My name is Jose. My last name is Pomar. I live in Paris. That's 10 seconds already? <laughs> You'll know. <laughs> okay. And I've been working for 25 years as an assistant professor at the University of Paris 13 in Paris that became a Sorbonne Paris Nord, among other things. Venkat Subramaniam, and I love the fact that Java is a hybrid language and it's still evolving with fantastic features. Just uh, absolutely amazing times to be using Java. So I always believe that we need to empower people so they can move away forward on their own path. And there's nothing better in the industry to move to your path, right? So Java is multi-platform, multi-vendor. You can work on anything. You can do anything that you want with it. So that's what I love about Java. I'm Bruno Souza. <laughs> I was going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Heather Van Cura. And what I love about Java is the passion of the Java developer community. Cool. Simple and sweet. I like it. Soundbite. <laughs> Share that one. Um, all right, so next question for everyone again. Why are you passionate about Java in education? I'm passionate uh, about Java in education because I think it's a really a ubiquitous language. <laughs> Actually, when you know Java, I think that you can really handle any kind of other language because so many other languages have imitated it. And uh, so that, that's actually opening a door to so many more things behind Java and just using the language. Well, I'm going to say Java is essential for education for, you know, on one hand, you can see that the rigor, the, the strength it brings in, the discipline it brings in to develop applications, learn about algorithms, and, and all the way up to building enterprise applications. On the other hand, it's also a fantastic research platform for both undergrads and grad students. There's so much there to push the boundaries. And if you're a student, I mean, what better is it to take the most popular ecosystem and do research on it, and it's open, so that's fantastic. So it's a great tool for learning. Yeah, so Java, you know, if you look at, look at what, how we develop a software, you know, 25 years ago, uh, Java completely changed the way we do that, right? So we have a much more, much more interesting ecosystem, much better way of developing software. You know, we solve amazing problems, right? And I think that the students that are able to enter in this ecosystem, enter in this, this world, right? They have a much better chance to create amazing software. And I'm passionate about Java and education because bringing up that next generation of Java developers is going to ensure that Java and the Java community continues to remain vibrant and relevant for decades to come. Awesome. All right. So I have four more questions, and we're going to have one person answer, answer each of these. And you get a little bit longer, 25 seconds, for each of these questions. So starting with Venkat, um, how has learning, oh, that's the wrong question. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> why is Java the best language for students to learn? <laughs> well, why is Java the best language for students to learn? I, I would say there are several important reason, reasons. You don't want students to learn a programming language alone. You want them to develop applications. You want them to learn about debugging, unit testing, which is extremely critical, and go beyond to it to build systems and learning how to develop applications that can sustain in the industry. So, so Java as not just a language, but as a platform and ecosystem, brings the rigor and the discipline that they can learn. And here's the best part. And once they finish learning it, 
they get to apply it on their jobs, and that's a fantastic opportunity. So you're not learning something totally theoretical, you're learning something that's practical, that can be used to make the you know, industry better. So that's a win-win in, in every direction you see it. Next question's for Heather. That was the one that I started to to say. <laughs> um, how has learning changed since you went to school? <laughs> I think learning has changed in that there's so many different modes of learning now. In addition to in-person learning and books, which was more common when I was going to school, you now have so many other methods and ways to learn. So not only online learning, but also things that you can read on blogs or in social media, YouTube videos, even TikTok videos. So the amount and type of information has changed phenomenally. It's really true. Um, okay, Jose, your turn. You're up. Uh, what is the most <clears throat> critical challenge in your mind in computer science education today? Mm. I think actually there are two challenges. The, 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 the first one is probably the most obvious one, uh, training your students so that they can find a job. That's the gist of it. And of course, but behind that, I think that the most important thing, and this is for me what education is about. Education is not just about learning or teaching technology. Education is about finding who you are to be able to find your place in a society as a free human being, yeah. all right? What are the, going to be the challenges in two years, five years, 10 years from now? Okay, and that's a log scale as you saw. Um, who knows? Well, we, maybe we have an idea about it, but we should be modest about that. And I think that the best way you can train your students is to train them precisely as responsible and sensible human beings so that they can face these challenges in, a, you know, in the right way and to help make the, the world better, which is exactly what technology is about, I think. Love that too. Thank you. Wow, I, I feel like I'm sitting with giants up here. <laughs> All right, Bruno, last but not least, uh, what is the most impactful thing you think industry can do to help students and teachers be successful in computer science? You know, the interesting thing is that there's no industry, right? There's you. There's, there's persons, right? There's people, there's you. So I know each one of us, we're not just part of an industry or part of a company, right? It's, it's the impact that you can make, right? So what is the thing that you can do in your city, in your, in your town, right? in, your, in your neighborhood, right? So you know, if you can go to a high school, for example, and talk a little bit about technology, if you can visit your local university and give a talk, uh, there, if you can get a student, right, someone, maybe someone in your family, right, does not even need to be far away, someone in your family, they can go and teach a little bit about, you know, about technology, about Java. That can make a huge, huge difference, right? So instead of we thinking about the industry and what, uh, what companies or everyone can do, how about we think about what we can do? And I think that's what Java groups are all about, for example, right? So you can join a Java group, you can participate, right? And so, I just gave a talk now, and, and I, I put on my Twitter, on my peanut message on my Twitter, I put a book, a free book for you guys to help you do this little action that you can take to make a difference in your, in your life and the lives of other people. So don't look at the industry. Look at what you can do. That makes a big difference. Fantastic. Love it. All right. Now you can clap. <laughs> Clap loud. <laughs> all right, so I'm kicking you off. But again, like I know we want to hear from you all, and I know there are others in the room who are passionate about this. So we'll look into doing some deeper interviews in the future and, and circulate this more. Great ideas out there. Thank you. I think my beach ball experiment failed. <laughs> All right, so um, I think you could probably agree that, especially as we age, it is our great privilege and our responsibility to bring up those that come behind us. And it is the single most important thing that we can do. Um, so the, why the beach balls? Besides the fun and something for me to look at, although you, you guys failed me. <laughs> um, the real reason is teamwork. If I had asked one of you, to keep one of those afloat for any amount of time, it probably wouldn't have happened. It took all of us to get them up in the air and move them around. And I think that this problem is exactly the same. It's gonna take a village of people to solve this problem, and it's very complicated. It's gonna take people with skills that some of us don't have, like 
professional educators or curriculum providers. It'll take people like parents and policymakers. And it also takes us, to Bruno's eloquent point, it takes us with our unique perspective and the unique value that we can add to make a difference. We can do things like create the infrastructure that allows a kid with an iPad to write their first Java program instead of having to install a bunch of stuff. We can advocate in our countries and our states for computer science to be a fundamental skill that kids all need to have for the future. We can share our knowledge with a teacher, help the teachers that don't get the training that they need be able to better do the jobs that they do well, which is inspire kids and educate kids. And we can also inspire kids. We can take their problems and make them our own, care about what the problems they want to solve, and help them do the things that they want to do with programming. Um, we need each of us, in my mind, to be Luella. It's our job to bridge that gap. And so I, I encourage you, think back. Think back to your story, your journey to this, to who you are today. What was your first program, your first computer, your first language? Um, what inspired you at first? What made you want to keep doing this? What is your job like? What's a day in your life like? And why do you love that? What inspires you now? Why do you keep doing this? What do you, what do, you do with it in your free time? What makes it fun for you? And why do you think Java is the best language for kids to learn for the future? So I'm planning to, to tweet out twice a month a question because I really do want to hear from you. I want to hear your stories and your thoughts and your perspectives. Um, I encourage us to share those thoughts and things in a way that reaches into, that's out of our echo chamber, right? Get back into the populations that we want to bring to us. Let's go to them, where they are. Um, I will admit I am not a big fan of social media to start with, but uh, I think I'm going to have to learn some TikTok. I encourage you guys to do the same. Discord, I think we need to be in the places where the kids are at. Um, I also plan as I'm out and about looking at, you know, hanging out at education conferences, a very different space for me. I'm happy to share what I learn and what I see and get your feedback on that. And we'll keep you updated on proposals for change and things that we plan to steward and how you can help. And I also want to hear back from you, your thoughts on how we can help. Thank you for letting me speak to you today. I really appreciate it. And thank you for sharing your perspectives along the way. It's been um, a joy for me this week. And now I want to welcome Nikolai back on. I don't know which side he's coming from. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Heather. No. Thank you, Heather. So all the drinks coming along? Good? Is he doing his work? OK. <laughs> That's great. So what Heather mentioned, uh, capturing the new generation with TikTok, the old generation, and that's us, uh, still pr uh, prefers reading and learning from a book. So let's talk about that with accomplished authors Jean Boyarsky and Maurice Neftelin. Welcome. So, Jean, you've written um, the, uh, the study guide and the practice tests to what's most commonly known as the Java certification. So why did you do that? I've always enjoyed teaching people, whether kids or adults, and watching them learn. In fact, I've been a moderator at Code Ranch for well over a decade doing just that. Learning is fun. I've enjoyed coding almost as long as I've enjoyed going to the library. So being able to combine those books and scaling learning has been awesome. But I knew writing a book was a lot of work, so I started slow. First, I reviewed a bunch of books on Amazon. Then I tech reviewed other people's books to get a feel for what the process entailed. When the opportunity came to contribute a chapter to someone else's book, I took it and learned even more. Finally, I was able to write my very own book with my co-author, Scott Selikoff, the books you see today. Great, thanks. So, um, Maurice, you've written Java Generics and Collections. I've written half of it. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're now working on the second edition. Let us know why. Well, it came out in 2006, and by now the enthusiasm for the exciting new features of var args and the for each loop is getting a bit embarrassing. 
But beyond, but beyond my embarrassment, there's actually two really good reasons for bringing it up to date. One of them is we've had now 25 years of experience of using the Java Collections Framework, and I think it would be useful to capture that and present it to pe people who are just starting out so that they can start from a better basis and the understanding of the, the idioms that we're using now. And the second reason is there's been an accumulation over time of a lot of new features, many of them quite small in the Java Collections Framework. There's been the uh, appearance of streams from Java 8, which changes the model of bulk data processing in Java. And generally, there's been the kind of movement of Java towards a more functional style. And all these things put together mean that it's really time to rethink the way that we present the Java Collections framework in, uh, to, to people who are just starting out with it. And there are still more changes coming around the corner as well that may get into the book if the timeline works out. So, so what are some of those? Well, I mean, one, small, one relatively small example of the sequence collections that Stuart Marks uh, proposed recently and has been talking about at this conference, and, and, in, and in the medium term, there's, or maybe sooner than that, there's, the clouds are going to part and we'll see this, the shape of this castle in the air that we call Valhalla, and that will change the collections, uh, the way we handle collections a, a great deal and probably impact the generics material at the start of the book as well. Yeah. yeah, I think really readers will really benefit greatly from diving deeper into those topics. Mm -hmm. So G, what's the value in, uh, in doing the uh, certification and like, working through your book? Reading a certification book helps deepen your understanding of Java. This helps you interview better and solve problems faster at work. Being able to look at long, complex code quickly, easily, and identify subtle problems is a very valuable skill. And keeping up to date with the certification book helps you read about those new features and understand them at that deep level. But the nice thing is, regardless of whether you actually plan to take the certification exam or not, the practice questions help you get a feel for those new features, internalize and retain the information, and spot those edge cases so you don't have to worry about being surprised in your code. So it's more than the certification, the value isn't just studying for it and learning all those things. Exactly. Yeah, and it's great that the Java community makes this expertise so freely available. So thanks both of you, Jean and Maurice, for doing just that. Thank you. So writing a book is pretty daunting. Truth be told, thanks to social media, I actually struggle to read a whole book at this point in time. Um, so maybe we can inspire you instead to write articles about Java, and no better place to publish them than Oracle's Java Magazine, and no better person to talk to us about that than Alan Seitschik. Welcome, Alan. Welcome. Hey, Nikolai, good to see you. Good to see you, too. So, Alan, tell us a little bit about the Java Magazine. OK, first of all, I wanted to say that this is the other Java Magazine. You heard earlier about the NL Jugs Java Magazine. This is completely different. This is an Oracle publication. It's published entirely online. It's been coming out for 11 years. It was started by Oracle. And it reaches about 235,000 Java developers all over the world. OK, so that sounds like very diverse. So what, what do they have in common? What they have in common is that they love Java. They could be Java architects working in the Java platform group. It could be Nikolai. It could be, hopefully, all of you, students, uh, teachers, people learning the language on the job, people work nine to five jobs, people who work you know, five to nine coding all night to contribute to their favorite open source project, architects, could be anybody at all levels from beginner to extreme expert. Okay, wow. So are most of your writers from Oracle? We about a third of our writers from Oracle. This is one of my favorite authors from Oracle. But uh, you probably have heard of or you've read uh, Ben Evans, uh, Eric Bruno, uh, Venkat, who you saw earlier, writes for us. Uh, Mala Gupta, who you saw earlier, writes for us. Uh, the quiz guys, uh, Simon and Mikolai. Uh, tons of people who do not work for Java, uh, do not work for Oracle, uh, contribute. And in fact, I would invite you all to contribute as well. Uh, you can contact me. We'll talk more about that in a second. But contact me, tell me your idea. And whether it's a long article, short article, in-depth architecture, or talking about your user group, uh, come to Java Magazine. So where do people find it then? So you go to uh, oracle.com slash Java Magazine. And uh, you can also reach me and, uh, at javamag underscore us at oracle.com. And I'd love to talk to you about your ideas for the magazine, how we can make it better, and uh, how you can help make it better. Yeah, I can all recommend that everybody give that a shot. It's a really great experience to write uh, with them. And so yeah, thank you very much, Alan. All right, thank you.
So, so far we've talked a lot about how to contribute by organizing a community, by teaching the next generation, by sharing knowledge. But the, way, the easiest way to contribute for most of us is still code. It's diving into your specialty, whatever that may be, and tackling the problems that only you or that you are best situated to solve. One such challenge is the increased computational demands, particularly in fields like machine learning, where yet Moore's law no longer delivers roughly twice the CPU power every two years, and so people are using a different computational architecture, the GPU, to run their programs. Um, right, <laughs> and so we at Oracle want to make it easier for you to run your, to run, uh, write Java code and run your programs on the GPU. And here to talk more about that is Richard Wang for NVIDIA. Hi, Nicolai. Hello, Richard. So I hear Oracle and NVIDIA have been cooperating. Uh, so can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. So NVIDIA has been working very closely with the Java team working on exploring the best way to integrate Java natively with GPU. So the Java team has been providing advice on the best way to use Java, and while the NVIDIA team provided feedback on what has been working and what could be improved through the integration of NVIDIA tooling as well as the CUDA native C library. And we are especially excited about the project Panama, which allows Java, which makes it much easier to integrate Java natively with GPUs. So, so how exactly does Project Panama help? So there are many ways, but my top two are, first, with Project Panama, we no longer need the Java native API. We know, all know that sometimes that can be a little bit hard to uh, integrate and to maintain the code. Secondly, Project Panama allows us to allocate the memory more effectively, so that helps the acceleration of, of GPU memory usage. Okay, so I heard that NVIDIA also announced an, an uh, interesting new chip, and that would be a very performant platform for Java programs. So what is that about? Yes, so the new NVIDIA Grease Hopper super chip would be a perfect fit for Java applications. The Grease Hopper platform combines a Grease CPU with a super powerful Hopper GPU using the NVLink C2C high performance link that enables coherent memory model. So Java fits into a class of applications where 95% of the code will stay on the CPU, but the 5% of the code can be accelerated by GPU and benefit from the massive performance gain. So the, low, the lower power grid CPU teamed with a high performance CPU will fit perfectly for Java application speedups. And the high-speed C2C link will also provide low latency and high bandwidth movement of data between the Java code on CPU and the code on GPU. Well, wow, that's really great. It's really cool that Oracle and uh, NVIDIA are cooperating to meet the computation demands of developers with innovative hardware and then Java to match. And especially new features like Project Panama, or hopefully in the future Project Valhalla, uh, can help with that. And I can only invite you to give that a try. At least Panama is already available as a preview feature in Java 19, and so you can give that a test drive. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you, Nikolai. But it's not only NVIDIA cooperating with Oracle and OpenJDK to make Java strong, stronger. This community has fostered countless fruitless um, collaborations, for example, Intel and ARM's contribution of, to the Vector API, to just name one more example. So you don't have to be a specialist at a large company to contribute, though. Well, you can start by writing articles or sharing about what you have used in your day-to-day -day job or your favorite project. And then when you grow your expertise, you can even write a book. You can teach Java to the next generation of developers, high school or college nearby you, or even to those less fortunate that do not afford education. You can participate in your local Java user group or maybe organize one if you don't already have one. 
Keep going to conferences, follow the Java channels on Twitter and YouTube, test drive the new releases of Java, read the OpenJDK mailing lists, and give your feedback. Most importantly, keep coding on your day-to-day -day job, as on your side project, on an open source project, or even become a member of OpenJDK. Truly, the future of Java is you. So thank you very much for being here at Java One. Enjoy the rest of this amazing conference, and we hope to see you again next year.